Thanks for joining us uh, for this month's Learn at Home presentation. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. As you can see, everyone's muted upon entry. Uh, following the presentation, we're gonna you'll be able to ask some questions by either using the raise your hand icon on the bottom. Um, if you feel more comfortable, you can also just type your questions into the Q&A as well. And then just one additional item, following the Learn at Home, you're gonna have a chance to complete a survey. Uh, the survey is just gonna help uh, with future event planning. Uh, with that said, today we're lucky to have uh, the ADRC's very own clinical core director, Dr. Arjun Maserker. Uh, Dr. Maserker is a physician scientist with a focus on the mechanisms, biomarkers, and therapeutics related to early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Dr. Maserker received both his MD as well as his PhD from Yale University and completed both his residency and fellowship at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Maserker wears many hats. He's an assistant professor of neurology and physiology, um, an attending neurologist here at the Pearl Barlow Center, and an investigator at the Neuroscience uh, Institute. So we welcome here, him here today, where he'll be discussing the science and medicine of memory. Dr. Maserker. Uh, thanks, Ashley, for a very nice introduction. So, um, yeah, so the title of my talk today is The Science and Medicine of Memory. Memory is a topic that's uh, uh, you know, discussed a lot. Uh, and I wanted to go through the different ways we can think about memory. So first, I'll talk about the science of memory, the biology of memory. And I like to give this analogy to my patients when we talk about memory. It's, I call it the office analogy. Um, you know, it really is based on the definition of what memory is. Memory is a process by which knowledge is en encoded, stored, and later retrieved uh, for use. And so this is sort of delineated by the, the process shown here. Um, so first, you know, if you're working in an office, you get your your file, your information, um, you then have to put it in the file cabinet into, into storage. And then lastly, you have to go back to that file cabinet and, and, and get it out. And so encoding is sort of um, assembling that file so that, so that it, you know where to put it in the file cabinet. Uh, the second step is storing it, putting it in this file cabinet itself in the right place. And the third stage is the retrieval is going back to the right place in the file cabinet and getting that knowledge out for when you need to use it. But memory is really on, only one aspect of thinking, of cognition. Uh, there are many, many domains, as we call them, of, of thought, of cognition. There's attention and concentration. There's planning and organization. There's language and a whole lot of other ones. Uh, there can be over from 50 to 100 different categories of thinking if you want to uh, uh, kind of divide it in that way. They're, they're, they're somewhat overlapping. For example, you need to understand language to remember things. You need to pay attention to remember things, and so on and so forth. Um, there are even different kinds of memory. So. One divide is between short-term memory and long-term memory. Um, short-term memory is related to information that you learned a few minutes ago. It could really extend up until information you learned uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that line between short-term and long-term is, is a little bit uh, fuzzy. Um, you know, Long-term memory certainly includes um, things that are biographical and things that are, that are really ingrained. Um, so, for example, um, we can divide, divide long-term memory um, into uh, declarative memory, which is memory of people, places, and things. So, um, where, you know, where you were born, um, the, 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 the trip you went to um, when you were a child, uh, the people you knew growing up, um, the games that you played, these are long-term factual memories. Then there's non-declarative memory. Um, those are related to, uh, for example, procedural things like learning to ride a, a bicycle uh, or playing a game. 
uh, there's associative memory, associative learning, which is sort of, uh, you know, the classic example is, is, you know, Pavlov's dog, you know, teaching a, a dog to associate a, a reward with the performance of a, on a task. Um, and then there's uh, something called non-associative learning, which uh, is basically habituating or, or being sensitized to something. So for example, this is a, a woman who's trying to read her book in, in the noisy uh, New York Central Park, and there's someone on the phone, there's a dog barking, and there's an ambulance in the background. So her ability to um, learn to forget about those distracting things is actually a form of, of learning and memory that's very important that we use all the time. Um, and, and what's important to know is that each kind of memory involves different areas of the brain, different brain circuits, different brain structures. So for example, um, certain kinds of procedural memories, uh, like tying your shoes or learning to ride a bike, uh, relates to the area of the brain called the striatum. It's really in the center of the brain. Um, associative learning, can be related to a very tiny peanut-sized structure named the amygdala, or uh, a structure in the way back of the brain called the cerebellum. But most importantly, uh, both short-term memory and declarative memory, memory for information, uh, relates to what's called the medial temporal lobe. That's on the that's on the sides of the head, and the medial temporal lobe is um, relate is is made up of many structures. Uh, one of which is called the, the, the hippocampus, which is what we'll talk about um, shortly. So, like I said, short-term memory is also related to a structure called the hippocampus. And um, the, the, the reason why it's called hippocampus is that if you actually extract it out of the brain, it kind of looks like a seahorse. So hippocampus is, is actually stemming from the Greek word for, for, uh, for seahorse. And um, the, the reason why we know the hippocampus is, a, is important for short-term memory is because of a, a volunteer, a research volunteer named H.M. And, and when H.M. was uh, a boy, he had very, very bad epilepsy, a lot of seizures that were emanating from his hippocampus and the temporal lobe. Uh, so, and they were, they were debilitating. And so, Back then, you know, we didn't know about um, what these structures did. So the surgeons removed his hippocampus. They removed his medial temporal lobe and cured him of his seizures. And he was able to live uh, a seizure-free life after that. However, uh, unfortunately, a side effect of that surgery was that HM was no longer able to form new memories. And his family noticed this, and somehow they got in touch with um, a psychologist, and he was studied for decades um, by research teams. Um, he devoted his time to be studied, um, and they, they realized that the removal of his hippocampus led to the short-term memory problem, um, and thereby they, they were able to link the, the structure of the hippocampus to the function of short-term memory. And, and this is actually a, a cartoon of what HM's brain looked like to the right with the hippocampus removed versus a normal brain to the left where you have an intact uh, hippocampus. And so what happens in the hippocampus? How do you even get short-term memory? Well, we don't, we don't know entirely, but we kind of know that it's a chemical reaction between brain cells. And if you use fancy stains and molecular uh, techniques, you can actually visualize all the brain cells within the hippocampus. So this is, this is the hippocampus. The different areas of the hippocampus are, are labeled different colors here. And the little sort of dots over here are individual brain cells uh, in the hippocampus. And the cartoon here is a, a kind of a, a zoom in uh, of an individual connection between brain cells. And what we think happens when a memory is formed is that there's a chemical reaction that leads to a strengthening of the connections between, between brain cells. And that's called plasticity or LTP, long-term plasticity. And what this graph is trying to show is that the, the electrical 
form of communication between these brain cells actually increases. You can see the, the wave, which is a signifying how strong these brain cells are talking to one another, goes from this size to this size after this plasticity is elicited. Um, there's a lot of research on how this plasticity, how these connections are formed and strengthened and how they're unstrengthened, um, all of which are important for, for learning and, and memory. But it does involve a series of chemical reactions. It involves proteins. It involves calcium. It involves electrical um, uh, conduction between brain cells. It's a very complicated process. Nobel Prizes have been given to this uh, process, but we're still trying to sort out e exactly what happens and, and trying to figure out exactly what doesn't happen correctly when someone has a memory problem. So I'd like to switch gears now to talk about the medicine of memory, now that we know a little bit about the science of memory. So memory disorders can happen really in two broad categories. One is losing good or important memories of your family, of where you're going, what appointments you have. And then of course, there are diseases, disorders of not being able to forget really bad memories. For example, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, people who have gone through war, a traumatic experience, violence, something like 9-11. So I'm not gonna talk about the that second one, not being able to forget bad memories, that's a very different topic, uh, more, more related to psychiatry. I'm going to talk about diseases related to losing memory, which is related to dementia. So it's important to know in this context that the hippocampus is an organ just like any other in the body. It has tissue, there's the brain structure itself, there's cells, it is receiving blood supply, just like other organs in the body. This is a delineation of the arteries, the capillaries that supply the hippocampus, just like it would the kidney or the heart. And when somebody has a disease of memory, for example, with Alzheimer's disease, you get problems within the tissue. You can also get problems in the blood vessels too. But in this case, with Alzheimer's disease, it primarily is a disease of the tissue itself. And so when you zoom in with a microscope uh, at hippocampal tissue that has Alzheimer's disease, you see this. What you see are two main problems. You see these um, kind of the, the fluffy inclusions, these sort of bigger uh, streaky things um, these collections, those are called amyloid plaques. And then you see these teardrop shaped elements. So those individual teardrops are actually brain cells that have tau pathology inside. So Alzheimer's disease actually attacks the brain from the outside of the brain cells with the amyloid plaques and from the inside of the brain cells through the tau tangles. So Alzheimer's is defined by both having amyloid and tau. They're both proteins that probably have some normal function. We don't exactly know, but it, in aging and in Alzheimer's disease, they basically become bad proteins. They become, their three-dimensional shape becomes uh, problematic. They are, they undergo some chemical changes that make them act in ways that they shouldn't. And that leads to them clumping up, causing problems from the outside of the brain cells and from the inside of the brain cells. And that causes the brain cells not to talk to one another properly. So that plasticity uh, action reaction doesn't happen properly. And eventually the brain cells die. And that's why you get some shrinkage of the brain as shown here. But it's important to know that not all memory loss is Alzheimer's disease. Um, going back to our three-step process, um, where you kind of encode information, you store it, and then you retrieve it, there are many conditions that can give rise to what looks like a memory problem, but are actually not Alzheimer's disease and affecting different parts of the memory pathway. So certainly, when you have a file cabinet problem, 
meaning you're really not storing the information there. That really means the hippocampus is damaged. The hippocampus has a problem. And so in those cases, we start to worry about Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury to the hippocampus, like getting hit in that area, a, a stroke to the hippocampus, um, something called hippocampal sclerosis. It's a thickening of the hippocampal tissue or seizures that are arising from the hippocampus itself. However, there are conditions that affect the other two pathways, meaning getting information organized the right way to be stored and getting information out efficiently. And those are non-Alzheimer's disease conditions. For example, depression, anxiety, insomnia, sleep apnea, attention disorders, Parkinson's and other Parkinson-like diseases, vascular disease and, and stroke can also affect these other two processes, diabetes that's not very well managed, endocrine problems like hypothyroidism, and vitamin deficiencies like B12. So we have to look very broadly when someone has a memory problem to make sure that it's, is it a storage problem indicative of Alzheimer's or, or hippocampal damage? Or is it really related to not storage? Meaning, is it related to organizing the information or getting it out efficiently? That would suggest these other processes. And also remember that not all memory loss is memory loss. We also have to make sure that someone's memory problem isn't really an attention or concentration problem, or that it's not a planning and organization problem or a language problem because those would suggest other conditions, not Alzheimer's disease. For example, there are certain kinds of frontotemporal dementia that affect planning and organization or language. And certain kinds of neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's disease and Lewy body can affect planning and organization and attention and concentration. Also remember that not all memory loss is abnormal. It's quite common in normal aging to have some trouble with doing multiple things at once, like multitasking, having some trouble remembering the name of that actor or actress, or remembering the name of the restaurant that you ate at the other day. If it's happening inconsistently, that's not really a big deal because these don't really impact your day-to-day -day function. Um, and so this is sort of a graph of how memory can decline uh, with, with just normal aging. It's, it's a relatively um, uh, uh, a straight line. The, the slope of that line doesn't really change that much. It's kind of shallow. Um, and when you look at the MRI of someone who has normal aging, you will find that the brain has shrunk down a little bit. If you, if you look, this is sort of looking right at somebody. Um, there is a little bit of shrinkage of the brain tissue, but it's pretty much uniform. So uniform shrinkage of the brain, meaning it's not happening one area or the other, it's not happening on the hippocampus versus other areas, not left versus right, that's suggestive of normal aging. But the next stage is called mild cognitive impairment. So that's when the slope of that line kind of deviates from normal aging. You're kind of getting a little bit more than just normal aging. It's, the problem is a bit more consistent. It probably is having still minimal impact on daily function, but it's, but it's measurable. We can actually do a bedside test. We ask for the three words after five minutes. Maybe you're getting only one. Maybe you're getting none, but you get them with a hint. But there are measurable issues um, that, that we can see uh, on, on clinical evaluation. Um, there, there can be forms of mild cognitive impairment that, that are not memory related. They can be language related. They can be executive, uh, organizational meaning. Uh, mild cognitive impairment uh, can be a harbinger of Alzheimer's disease dementia. It's sort of that in-between phase between normal and dementia. 
so we can be predictive of future decline towards Alzheimer's dementia. But it's not always Alzheimer's, as I mentioned. There are multiple biological causes. It could be due from stroke, Parkinson's, even mood disorders can cause a, a mild cognitive impairment sort of syndrome. And that being said, a lot of these can be treatable. Um, and when you, when you look on imaging at someone who has mild cognitive impairment, here's when you start to see a little bit more shrinkage. It's a little bit more apparent in certain areas versus in other. You may start to see some strokes on the MRI. You might start to see some uh, shrinkage or atrophy is the medical word of the, of the hippocampus uh, more than what would, would be expected in normal aging. So the arrow is sort of indicating the hippocampus here. It's a little bit smaller than it should be for, for compared to someone with normal aging. And, and the fluid cavities in the brain, they're called ventricles, also become a little larger. Then we get to something called dementia, right? So that's when the, the, the decline has really deviated from normal aging. And you're really crossing the threshold of functional impairment. It's impacting daily function. It's consistent. Um, that person is now dependent on others to do what's called the instrumental activities of daily living. That's like paying bills, doing errands, um, managing pills, and can even progress towards personal hygiene, bathroom, bathing, dressing. Again, there can be non-memory forms of dementia. It's not always Alzheimer's disease. It can be Parkinson's, stroke, Lewy body, frontotemporal, et cetera. But Alzheimer's disease is the most common. It's about 70% of all dementia. Uh, but again, we, we always want to look for, for treatable causes. There are some rare treatable causes of dementia. They can be inflammatory or infectious or vitamin related. And here is where the shrinkage becomes even more apparent. So here's sort of, again, a normal aging brain with a little bit of uniform shrinkage, someone with mild cognitive impairment where the shrinkage is a little more, maybe more apparent in that medial temporal lobe where the hippocampus is. And then you have dementia where now the shrinkage is even more apparent. Um, it's maybe even affecting more than one brain area, more than just the hippocampus. But that being said, no matter what's going on, I always like to focus on fixing the fixable things. And here's one way of looking at it, sort of going back to that office analogy. A lot of the things that I listed there are treatable entities. So when it comes down to organizing the information you want to store in memory, depression, sleep problems, attention problems, blood vessel uh, disease, diabetes, endocrine and vitamin deficiencies are all manageable problems, fixable problems that can be tuned up to help that part of the process, as well as the other part of the process, the third step, which is the getting the information out. And then there are things like diet, exercise, blood pressure control, um, hearing loss, vision impairment. These are sort of, um, uh, you know, indirectly associated uh, uh, medical lifestyle issues that can also impact these processes. So whenever I see a patient with memory problems, yes, you wanna diagnose MCI, you wanna diagnose the dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or not, but I think it's important to also hi highlight and hone in on the things that are fixable. There, there's another way to look at these modifiable factors, as I call them, and I put them in three categories, lifestyle, medical problems, and medications. So in terms of modifiable risk factors, first is exercise. So we now know that exercise is very important for memory. It increases the blood flow to our memory centers, to the hippocampus, right? Remember the hippocampus gets blood flow from these capillaries. There's some evidence that it may help grow new brain cells in the memory centers. Exercise is really great to enhance our mood and sleep. 
So that can indirectly help with memory. How much to do? What do I prescribe? We don't really know, but I, but, but I usually say it's about 20 to 30 minutes a day, depending on one's stamina and one's other medical problems. That's, that's important to do every day. Um, and it should be aerobic. What does aerobic mean? So lifting weights and doing stretching and yoga, Pilates, those are, those are good. They have their place in, in health. But we're talking about walking swimming, exercise bike, something that gets the heart pumping. That's the kind of exercise where the evidence shows that it affects memory and it affects, affects long-term outcomes in terms of dementia. The next is diet. We are what we eat, right? So we, we know that um, eating a specific kind of brain healthy diet and the diet that's been most studied is called the Mediterranean diet, which, which really stresses lean proteins from chicken and fish, olive oil, um, legumes, greens. We know that diets like that can actually promote less shrinkage of the memory centers. And part of a healthy diet is also controlling those heart disease factors, right? Reducing the salt intake, reducing the sugar intake, having a good source of vitamins like B12. So there are a lot of diets out there. The Mediterranean diet is a good diet. There's also something called the MIND diet. Um, but the important part is lean sources of protein, healthy oils, um, vegetables that are those bright colors, the bright greens and the um, you know, orange, you know, the, the peppers and the carrots. Um, th th those are all important for, for diet. Socializing. Socializing is great. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly uh, promoted as a pillar of brain health. It might slow the progression of cognitive decline. Why is that? Well, when we're with people, uh, our brain releases good, good chemicals for brain health. Um, it helps maintain our focus. When we socialize, especially with people outside of our families, which I know is hard to do in the pandemic, um, but when we're with friends, we're kind of you know, on our toes a little bit. When we, when we tend to hang out with our family, it's, it's good to have that social support, but we can get a little bit, little bit lazy with our, you know, with our life partner, with our, with our you know, people we live with. Uh, so, so being with people outside of the home, interacting with them, I think helps us maintain focus. It helps us be, be oriented by having a social schedule in the first place. Helps with mood as well. And lastly, it's cognitive stimulation. So I get this question a lot. Oh, what, what game should I play? What, you know, what should I learn? Should I do puzzles? We don't really know. Um, there's no magic puzzle that's better than the others. I say you should do what interests you, because if you don't, you're not going to do it. You should do different things. So if you like playing cards, maybe change up the rules, play with different people, uh, make it harder, make it challenging. Um, you know, if, if you're someone who is a mathematical person, maybe do something more artistic uh, because you're kind of using a different part of your brain than you had been during your working life. It's great when you couple this, the, the cognitive stimulation with a social activity like, like these gentlemen are, are, are doing with their card game. And what the cognitive stimulation activities do, they actually help our brain develop new strategies subconsciously to battle the age-related structural problems in the brain. So what I've noticed is people who have, a lot, have had a lot of cognitive stimulation in their life and continue to do so, they look better than their MRI. So their MRI could actually look like there's a lot of shrinkage. But because they're continually stimulating their mind, they, they had been stimulating their mind before, they're able to kind of subconsciously overcome that shrinkage to, to a certain degree. So next are the, the, the medical problems. And um, those are related to the lifestyle issues uh, also. So those include uh, insomnia, sleep apnea, um, cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, high cholesterol, sugar control, vitamin deficiency, uh, mood disorders like depression and anxiety, endocrine problems as well as sources of inflammation and sensory problems. 
and I want to highlight inflammation for a moment. Uh, inflammation is a very hot topic in the Alzheimer's field now. We think that uh, people who have uh, mutations in the inflammatory pathways or who where there's a lot of inflammation going on in the brain that can actually accelerate the dementia process, accelerate the progression. So what one common cause of inflammation, uh, a routine is, is oral hygiene, oral health. So they, they found that overgrowth of certain bacteria and the inflammation associated with that may be specifically associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And, and so we're studying kind of the molecular mechanisms of that so that we can sort of make use of that for, for, for developing new drugs. But I think it really promotes good oral health as a modifiable factor um, in, in Alzheimer's disease progression. And I also think that promoting good oral health also just promotes good general health as well. And it actually helps to establish a good day and night routine. So it helps those people who are a bit more further along with, with orientation to time. Um, so keeping, you know, going to the dentist, uh, brushing well, flossing is really important for, for cognitive health as well. And I, and I actually recommend, you know, especially for people who are further along, you know, more having more advanced phases of dementia that using an electric to toothbrush is better than a manual. And the other uh, thing I wanted to highlight was sensory problems. Um, we are finding that sensory problems can actually happen even at the beginning of, of the dementia process, even at the pre-dementia uh, stage. So it's loss of smell, loss of hearing, vision. But specifically, I wanted to highlight hearing because that's a fixable thing. And one practical matter is you can't remember what you can't hear. So you might as well Get your hearing checked. Make sure it's optimized. Get the hearing aid if, if, if you need one. Tuning up your hearing helps with social engagement. You know, it helps you interact with people in social settings. It enhances your ability to take in those cognitive stimulating activities. And they've also shown that people who don't, who have a hearing problem and don't correct it, their memory centers or hippocampi actually shrink faster than those who actually did correct their, their hearing. So there was a lot of reasons to, to pay attention to sensory problems. Uh, and lastly, there's the, the entity which I call polypharmacy. So just being on medication. So medications are good, right? You need to take the medications that you need to take. Um, but things can get a little bit confusing. I know that people see doctors here and there. There's a lot of times the, the, the medication uh, lists can get confusing uh, depending on you know, how many other medical conditions one has. So it's really important to review your medications with your primary doctor to make sure that you're on the right ones. And I would recommend bring in, bringing in the bottles so that, so that you're aware of what you're taking. Sometimes I have a list of the medications and I think it's right, but then the patient it has a different set of bottles. And so it's really important that for all of us to, to, to know exactly what you're on so that we're not, um, we have the right doses of things and you're not on things that you're not supposed to be. And there are certain categories of medications that can impact memory more than others. So one category are, are medications that have anticholinergic effects. So Acetylcholine is a very important chemical for memory for that plasticity process that I mentioned. Um, and there, there are medications that inadvertently affect that chemical. They actually inhibit the ability of that chemical to, uh, to impact the memory process. So medications like antihistamines, Benadryl, things like that, you, you know, the sleep, you know, there's certain forms of, um, 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 sleep aids over the counter that have antihistamines in it. Urological medications can, can sometimes have um, uh, uh, anticholinergic effects. And certain kinds of antidepressants uh, can have anticholinergic effects. Um, opiates, obviously, it's been a hot topic uh, recently. And so, you know, you want to make sure that 
you, you, if you're taking pain, med pain medications, that you, you're on the, the right dose and that there's a plan and that you're not on too much that can slow down memory. And then there's uh, benzodiazepines. So those are things like um, um, uh, lorazepam, Ativan, uh, clonazepam. They usually end in PAMs or AMs. Th those are medications that are good in the right setting, um, but they can, uh, they can impact thinking and memory nonetheless. And so you want to have a good plan for being on them, being, being getting off of them if you don't need them anymore. Um, and, and with these medications, th these, these effects are temporary. Um, so um, if, you, if you go off the medication, the impact on memory will then be lifted. So they don't cause, as far as we know, a permanent decline in memory. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I wanted to be somewhat efficient with the talk so that uh, we have plenty of time for, for questions. Um, so I will stop there. I will leave, I will leave the slides up in case um, we need to refer to them.